start with the semiconductor lasers, the device structure characteristics and uh, various designs with the special uh, characteristics. Semiconductor lasers were first invented in uh, 1962 by four different groups almost simultaneously. So, usually one does not uh, assign credit to any one group, but the main advantages of semiconductor lasers are they are compact. We already, already know the size that is involved is very small. A helium neon laser with about uh, 1 foot long gives you about 5 milliwatt of power. A small semiconductor laser can give you 100 milliwatts of power is very compact and uh, very efficient. Efficiency is uh, measured in terms of power conversion efficiency, it is uh, very efficient. Uh, normal bulk lasers have efficiencies between 0.1 to 1 percent normally except really carbon dioxide laser which has high efficiency. Otherwise, most of the bulk lasers are uh, very inefficient in terms of power conversion electrical to optical, whereas semiconductor lasers are very efficient, efficiencies normally are 20 to 30 percent electrical to optical conversion. And uh, there are devices people have shown uh, efficiency in excess of 60 percent that is uh, just consuming 2 milliwatt of power and uh, electrical power 2 milliwatt which is very, very low and giving 1 milliwatt of uh, optical power that is really very efficient. The other important characteristic why semiconductor laser is used in communication and uh, all the consumer applications is the possibility of direct modulation. Most of the bulk lasers modulation here we refer to any signal or any communication is sent through modulation. So, most of the bulk lasers you use the laser output and put an external modulator here. So, this is an external modulator. Whereas, in semiconductor laser for most practical purposes except when the speed involved is more than several gigabit per second, it is sufficient you can directly modulate. So, you simply bias the modulation current here, bias the diode current by the modulating signal and you will get accordingly the output. So, this is called direct modulation that is the modulating signal is directly superimposed on the diode bias current. Whereas, in bulk lasers you usually have a CW output here continuous wave output and the modulator then biases modulator then modulates with the required. So, you feed the modulating signal here onto the modulator. The modulator takes input, the digital input or the modulated bit pattern is fed to the external modulator and whereas, in the case of semiconductor lasers direct modulation and this is very, very helpful. It saves use of one additional component, one additional device is not required, you can directly modulate by modulating the current. Optoelectronic integration, this is uh, quite clear optoelectronic integration here. We are referring to integration of source detectors and modulators. There are chips now available where you have several components which are integrated on a single chip. So, you may have source at this end, I am just a schematically showing a source here which is giving digital output, optical output which is coupled to a modulator. For example, electro absorption modulator which is also semiconductor based. So, you couple it to a modulator and you can also detect the output the detectors are also semiconductor based. So, the source modulator here and the detector and of course, the channel itself where you can further have other effects the channel, the optical channel is also everything integrated on a single chip. So, this is what we are referring to as 
optoelectronic integration on a single chip. But usually the number of components on a chip are not very large, a few components only 4, 6, 8, not more than that normally on a chip. Whereas uh, when you talk of uh, VLSI or microelectronics, you are talking, talking of millions of components on a chip. So we do not have that kind of numbers, but nevertheless you can integrate some of the active devices and components on a single chip. This is what we refer to as optoelectronic integration. The basic structure of a semiconductor laser is as we have discussed in detail, it is a forward biased p-n junction here, it is a forward biased p-n junction and made of a direct band gap material such as gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, we have discussed in enough detail. But I would like you to see this structure here, what is shown with the typical dimensions. So, the structure, this is the length dimension, length and this is the width dimension. So, typically 300 micron here, width is about 200 micron and thickness of the substrate is approximately of the order of 100 micron. It has two cleaved facets. Yesterday I mentioned about cleaved facets acting as mirrors at the two ends it has cleaved facets so that light which is generated and light which is traveling in this direction here forms a resonator. Whereas it all the other two ends which are here and on the other side that is this facet and on the back side here are saw cut usually saw cut that is cut with a saw or so that you have a rough surface in this side. On the other two sides there is rough surface otherwise light could as well have built up in this direction like this. It could have gone back and forth in this direction which means light could have come from here that is from this output here. So, you want light to come in from a particular direction and therefore two sides are saw cut the other two sides are cleaved. So, that resonator is formed in that direction and current flows through the device. Originally when it was discovered in 1962, they were homo junction lasers that is simple p n junctions, highly doped p and n materials forming a p n junction and the depletion region or the active region here has a thickness of approximate d which is typically 1 to 2 micron in a p n junction and uh, this is the front view, the width is about 200 micron, the side length is about uh, 300 micron as we saw in the previous slide. The carrier distribution across the junction, these are basics which we have already discussed in detail. So, let me quickly go through them. The carrier distribution across the junction is shown here. So, this is uh, n of x here, the carrier density across the p n junction, this is x direction. So, p side and n side, here p is the majority carrier and it drops down across the junction and this is our recombination region or the active region, very quickly recalling. Now, let us see this gain coefficient in a semiconductor, we have got this expression for gain coefficient, I hope uh, those of you at the back are able to read it, it is a little small, but I wanted to show the two figures on the same diagram some discussion, some explanation is required here. We have got this uh, expression for gain coefficient, gamma is equal to C by n whole square 8 pi mu square into 1 over h cross square tau r. h cross square tau into h nu minus e g, actually h cross square tau, we had used tau there, so let me not write tau r, h cross square tau h nu minus e g to the power half into, that is f g, last one is f g, that is f c of e 2, it is in quasi equilibrium and f v of e 1. e 2 is a level such that this is for gamma of nu gain coefficient gamma of nu and E2 and E1 are such that H nu is equal to E2 minus E1. So, all the quantities in, the in this expression we know and this 
if you plot for different energies, this is what we have already plotted. So, here, so when you are in the last class also we have discussed this. This is H nu and this is gamma, gamma of and this point is E g. Is that all right? H nu, gamma of nu versus H nu. So, this is for different values of, these are for different values of delta L. Now, this is the plot for the active medium. The peak gain coefficient here, gamma p, gamma p, gamma p here. So, these are the peak gain coefficient corresponding to various values of delta n. So, if you call this as delta n 0 or delta n 1, delta n 2, delta n 3, this is delta n 1 2, okay. it is not delta n 1. So, various values of delta n, delta n 3, delta n 4 and delta n 5, there are different values of gain coefficient here. The peak gain coefficient, if you plot this gain coefficient, the second curve what it shows is, this is not theoretical, this is in practice it is found that gamma p if you plot for different values of delta n, then they all form almost in a straight line. The peak value and this quantity here is alpha a. When delta n is 0, which means you are not pumping, the semiconductor is in, there is no excess carrier concentration, which means you are not pumping it, this is the absorption coefficient alpha a. And the value of delta n, where neither gain nor this, so this is 0 here, 0. So, the value of delta n at which the peak gain, please see, there is no peak here, but so, if I take this particular delta n here, you can see that the peak is just 0. For this value of delta n, when, it, I am transi when the transition takes place from negative side to positive side, there is a place where the peak is at 0. And that value of delta n is called the transparency carrier concentration, delta n t, capital T standing for transparency. So, transparency carrier concentration, carrier concentration. And the equation of the line is therefore written as you can see this. So, this is gamma p, this what I have plotted is the peak value of gamma for different values of delta n. So, gamma p is equal to alpha a into delta n my by delta n t minus 1. You can see this when delta n is equal to delta n t, gamma p is 0 and when delta n equal to 0, it is minus alpha a. So, here alpha a, this is the equation of the straight line. It is approximately a straight line, it is not any theoretical this one. So, it happens that it is approximately a straight line, but this can be used uh, reasonably with a good approximation. Gamma p is equal to alpha a into delta n minus delta n t. Please recall that delta n t is the carrier concentration when the peak gain coefficient is 0. Gain coefficient is 0 means it is neither absorbing nor amplifying or the medium acts like as if it is transparent. There is no absorption, no amplification means what? It is transparent. So, no change in the intensity. So, you have a medium here and if this is transparent, whatever is input goes out. So, neither amplification nor absorption. That is why the name transparency carrier concentration, delta N t. Okay? All right. So, this uh, slide is uh, clear then. 
So, let us go to the peak gain coefficient which is given by this expression here where delta n Let me raise this and keep only the expression because delta n is related to the current density. We have already derived this expression. So, delta n here is equal to i by e. Recall that we had this expression divided by L into w into d. L into w into d. L into w into d, L is the length, w is the width. So, L w is the surface area and that is why we write this as s. So, surface area s and i by s current divided by s is j. So, this is j into tau divided by E d. So, delta n is equal to j tau E d and therefore, delta n t here is equal to j t. This is called the transparency current density into tau by E d. So, normally one talks in terms of transparency current density. You could also write therefore, you will see that delta n divided by delta n t is equal to j divided by j t is equal to i divided by i t. delta n divided by delta n t is j by j t all others cancel. It is also equal to i divided by i t. So, i t is the transparency current through the device, j t is the transparency current density and delta n t is the transparency carrier concentration. Is this okay? So, all the parameters are defined again here and alpha a is the absorption coefficient. An example is given here, this is from one of the books just taken as an example, indium gallium arsenide phosphide laser amplifier, j t the transparency current density is E into d by eta i into tau r, there was tau you recall that eta i by we have derived this expression eta i is equal to tau by tau r. So, that tau has been replaced by eta i into tau in the denominator eta i into tau r because eta i is known for the material and tau r also is a measurable parameter. You could have kept a tau itself. Eta i is typically 0.5 some numbers we have put d is about 2 micrometer and tau r is of the order of nanosecond. Transparency carrier concentration is given here delta n t because please remember it is delta n which will determine the separation between the Fermi levels. So, the separation between the Fermi levels should be such that you have to reach a situation where there is neither gain nor loss and therefore, delta n t is the parameter for a given semiconductor which will determine transparency alpha a is the absorption coefficient at that frequency typical numbers as you can see 600 centimeter inverse and e is the charge. So, if you substitute all this in this you get delta j t the transparency uh, current density as 40 kilo amperes per centimeter square and or the transparency current is this into a, a is l into w is the surface area a or s I call s here. So, it is a area here. So, j t into a here refers to area actually I should have used s. So, j t into w into l you substitute and you get 24 amperes. What does that mean? You have a diode through which you have to pass 24 amperes to reach transparency. You can imagine 24 amperes uh, what kind of current it is then air conditioner takes uh, 10 to 12 amperes and uh, a small diode uh, taking 24 amperes uh, it will simply burn off and this is exactly the reason although semiconductor laser was discovered in 1962 it never could operate 
on CW mode, continuous wave mode. They could show lasing in pulsed mode only because in pulsed mode you can achieve the peak current of 24 amperes. That is not a problem. Achieving peak current is not a problem. But average current or continuous current of 24 amperes the diode just cannot withstand. And therefore, for 8 years till 1970, from 1960 to 19, 1962 to 1970, all the semiconductor lasers were only pulsed semiconductor lasers. There was no CW laser just because of this number. This number tells you that how can we achieve lasing. Now, let us see further. Therefore, how to how to bring this number to a reasonable order? What are the possibilities? Suppose you reduce W that was the width. If you see the front view, the width. The width was 200 micron. Suppose somehow you reduce it to 10 micron, which means a factor of 20. So, you have brought down the current from 24 amperes to 1.2 amperes because a factor of 20 W has been reduced. So, it is 1.2 amperes. You are now in a reasonable limit. If you further decrease D, D for a normal p-n junction, homo junction laser, homo junction uh, p-n junction, it was about 1 to 2 micron. If you reduce it to 0.2 or 0.1, you get another factor of 10. And then the transparency current comes down to 120 milliamp. This was the simple idea at an ingenious idea brought by Z. Alfaro here who got finally the Nobel Prize in 1970, this was this has come and he got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2000. I used to teach this course right from 1995 and uh, always used to wonder what a nice idea this is, what a beautiful idea which led to and in 2000 he got uh, Nobel Prize. So, how to reduce D and how to reduce W? We said if we could reduce then it will work. So, how to reduce? And this is by the use of heterostructures. Some amount of discussion we already have had. And uh, here is heterojunction lasers that brought into the picture heterojunction lasers. Heterojunction refers to junction between dissimilar semiconductors. We have seen this. And uh, double heterostructure laser, the basic structure has a thin layer of gallium arsenide active region. Gallium arsenide I have used as a typical material about 0.1 to 0.2 micron thick sandwiched between two layers of high band gap material which is aluminum gallium arsenide for that material system. So, why heterostructure? Some amount we have discussed. The advantages are carrier confinement, optical confinement, lower losses, design flexibility. I have written 5 and 6 just left a gap because there are many more advantages. So, you can uh, if you are interested you can find out, but the first three are the basic advantages most important advantages. By design flexibility I mean for example, I have listed here design flexibility. You can take different compositions of x the alloy fraction. So, for example, the basic structure although the basic structure is just this here. This material if you take uh, aluminum gallium arsenide ALX gallium 1 minus x arsenide and this is gallium arsenide. Please see that depending on the x fraction you will have different depths there plus the refractive index. This material has refractive index 3.6. Depending on x this may have refractive index 3.55. 3.6, 3.5, 3.4 and so on depending on the value of x. So, what are you changing? You are changing n1 minus n2. Therefore, the confinement of the mode can be changed for a given thickness. You can also because of the double heterostructure, you have a provision of choosing 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2 micrometer as the thickness. So, these are design flexibilities. So, this is what I meant by design and there are many other advantages. So, very quickly the p n junction diagram before contact in a homo junction. So, p and n no explanation is required I suppose everything is clear there. 
and after contact as we see before forward biasing we have one Fermi level throughout this is the built in voltage built in potential here and uh, electrons are here holes are here plenty of holes these uh, circles small circles represent holes and these represent uh, electrons. But in the same position of x vertical this horizontal axis is x therefore at a given position x in the junction region there are very little electrons and holes for recombination. But when you forward bias the side of the band gets higher energy and therefore electrons move to this side holes move on to the other side because the barrier is lower and therefore in the same position of x now you have plenty of electrons and holes available for recombination and generation of photons. The point in the previous case is that the junction region active region here is 1 to 2 micron thick and by going to heterostructure two things which happen is you choose D therefore 0.1 micron, 0.15 micron you can choose so you are able to and because of this combination of high band gap and low band gap materials we have here potential barriers the electron when forward biased the electron comes to this active region yes but the barrier still exists on the other side. So, the electron is forced to remain in this region active region and similarly the holes are confined to the active region and the density the concentration of carriers become extremely high for the same current because the volume where they are confined is very small. So, the carrier concentration is the carrier per unit volume becomes very high and it is delta n which will determine the separation between the Fermi levels. Therefore, as we discussed earlier even by passing a moderate current or a small current you are able to get now the separation between the Fermi levels very large. The second point optical confinement again this is quite clear here this is these are the cladding layers which have lower refractive index this is the active region here are the regions. So, this forms an optical waveguide which means it confines an optical guided wave which is an optical mode profile which is shown here is mode profile and this is the longitudinal cross section of the laser. So, if you see the longitudinal cross section which means this is the length direction 300 micron is shown here length and uh, in the active region the mode propagates back and forth and at each end at each of these cleaved ends it undergoes partial reflection giving you the output the remaining light acts as a feedback optical feedback. All right, types of Fabry Perot lasers. They are broadly classified as gain guided lasers and index guided lasers. I have shown a typical structure of gain guided and index guided lasers. So, you can see that in a gain guided laser, as the name indicates, the beam here is guided by the gain. This what is shown is the front view, the front view. So, this is the laser chip, what is shown is the front view, the light is coming in this. So, the region is guided by gain. What do I mean by that? Because the electrode here contact electrode here is restricted to a small region of about 5 to 6 micron. The carriers primarily flow over a region of about 10 micron maybe 5 to 10 micron width and that means only in this region you have high carrier concentration which means only in this region you have high gain and therefore, if you see this strip it is a strip all along the length and therefore, the gain is confined to a strip all along the length which means the generated optical beam has to be confined only to that strip. There is no physical barrier there is nothing which is physically confining, but the gain is available only there. Therefore, the light builds up only under that contact electrode contact strip and therefore, this is called gain guided laser. The second one here structure as the name indicates is index guided. So, 
that means you see there, there are different materials here, here the refractive index is different, here it is different, here it is different. So, the refractive index let me show you a uh, make it clear by showing a simpler structure. So, the structure is this. So, what is shown there is a strip which is a rectangular strip here. So, this is P, this is N, this is N and this is also N. Sorry. And in between, so this is I and this region, what should be this region? Because I want this region to be reverse biased. So, you have a structure which has so, this is n, this is n and this is p, this region and this region is p. Please see. This is n p, n p is the reverse biased. You have applied positive here and you have applied negative here. So, only p n is the forward biased junction, this is reverse biased, this is forward biased, but from here it is reverse biased. Therefore, the carriers have to flow through this active region, this is the active region and therefore, light is generated in the active region. At the same time, the materials are different here, therefore, you choose the refractive index such that this region has a refractive index N1 all around it has different refractive indices, but less than n1. So, what is this strip? This strip, please see this is the front view as I have already mentioned front view. So, it is like this front view, which means all the region which is outside has refractive index lower compared to the active region. And therefore, this acts as an optical waveguide. It is like fiber which has uh, cladding everywhere or it is like a buried channel waveguide. For simplicity, I show you a rectangular waveguide like this which has N1 here and N2 everywhere. So, light is confined only to this. So, you have light which is confined to the central region. Exactly like that, light here generated is confined to the central region. What is confining? Refractive index difference and hence the name index guided laser. In the previous case, it was in the previous case there is no refractive index barrier here. Light is confined to that strip because gain is available only under that. That is why it is index guided, uh, that is why it is gain guided. Here it is index guided. So, naturally you can see to make such a structure, the process steps involved are much larger. For the first structure, gain guided laser, it is very easy, they are all simply monolithically deposited epitaxial layers, one layer on another, one layer on another. Whereas, to make such a structure, you have to use several processes of etching and regrowth, it is called etch and regrowth. So, to achieve such a structure. Whereas, in the gain guided laser, it is simply epitaxial layer deposition and therefore, what would you expect? The gain guided lasers are much cheaper compared to the index guided lasers. For most of the commercial applications, it is sufficient to use index guided lasers which cost anywhere few dollars or few hundred rupees all the applications which they use for pointers and uh, various uh, applications, it is the guided laser which is used. Because you can fabricate in bulk very large numbers and very simple processes of epitaxially depositing layers, required layers. Whereas, here you have to deposit layer, you have to etch the required, you have to 
So, I have lithography to etch the required portions and then regrowth with another material and that is a and these cost at least 10 to 100 times more than gain guided laser. The cost of these are 10 to 100 times that of gain guided lasers. But where do you need this? Why do we go for such lasers? The field profile here, the field profile in a gain guided laser depends on the current that is passing through. This is something important. This is an optical waveguide. The field profile is the profile of the mode of the waveguide. The mode field profile is independent of the power. The optical power, the power means current. You are passing initially, let us say you are passing I is equal to 10 milliampere. Then you want to pass 50 milliampere, you want to get more power. The beam will remain the same, power in the beam will increase, but the beam does not spread or its field profile does not change because the field profile is determined by the optical waveguide. It is the optical wave guidance which determines the field profile that is the transverse mode profile of the laser beam. Whereas, in the case of a gain guided laser, see this now, it will become clear. So, let me draw only that region. So, you have the contact here. This is the active region and let us say the carrier's flow is here and here is the field which is generated. In this direction, it is guided, it is a planar slab waveguide. But from the sides, there is no confinement, no confinement from the sides. Everywhere it is front view, please remember, I always am discussing about the front view, means it is coming like this. From the transverse side, there is no confinement. So, when I pass a current of I, I equal to let us say 20 milliampere, gain is available only over a small region here, because the carrier concentration is sufficient to give gain in a small region. But so, if I want to show the carrier profile, the carrier profile may look something like this, carrier concentration which is going. But if I pass now 50 milliampere and assume that this much, I hope you are able to understand, this is the transverse direction. What I have shown is n of x, let us say n of x versus x. And let us say this is the level required for having gain the carrier concentration. If I now increase the current to 50 milliampere, the carrier profile will increase like this, which means you see gain is up to this, because the line is the same, the minimum carrier concentration required is the same. In this case, within this region there was gain, within this x value. Now because my carrier concentration I am passing more current, which means the carrier spread is more and therefore, over a wider region, we can expand this and you can expand this and see, over a wider region there is gain, which means this spot size will become now bigger. You understand? If you pass a small current, then the beam profile is narrow, because only in the central portion there is gain. If you pass higher current, the beam profile is spreading, means what? The profile of the beam intensity distribution here changes with the current, which does not happen here. There are applications where you do not want the field profile to change with current through the device. Current you are changing because you want to change the power. Here the field profile would change. So, whenever you want an application where you want to maintain a constant field profile, for example, you want to use it in holography, where you have to recover, you do not want the field profile to change. But if your focus is only on intensity, intensity of the laser beam, if you want to make use, you do not worry about the field profile spreading or not, you just want intensity there. 
you increase the current, you want more intensity. Then it does not matter. So most of the consumer lasers are these ones. That's why they are very inexpensive because you are making use of intensity and fast modulation capabilities of laser diodes. However, it is important to know because if you are a buyer of laser diodes working in some company, there is always uh, specified index guided lasers in the technical data sheet you will see index guided or gain guided. Index guided will be much more expensive and therefore depending on unless your application requires index guided there is no point in buying index guided. All right. The basic laser theory we briefly discussed yesterday. It is an oscillator, laser is an oscillator which means it is gain plus feedback. The gain coefficient, peak gain coefficient is given by an expression of this form. So, if you are looking at the peak, the frequency corresponding to the peak gain, if we equate this gain coefficient to the resonator loss, so that is what is written here. For steady state oscillation, gain equal to resonator loss, which means at threshold, this is gamma pt, the peak gain coefficient at threshold is given by equal to the resonator loss which is here and uh, substitute some typical values. Yesterday we had done some numbers and you see gamma p t is 60 centimeter inverse. Yesterday I had taken probably the same numbers, right. Typical numbers these are all right. What we now bring the concept of threshold current. One is transparency current and the other is threshold current. So, both are here. So, you equate gamma p at threshold gamma p t is equal to alpha a into delta n by delta n t. So, this is delta n by delta n t minus 1. I can replace this delta n by delta n t by i and i t transparency because I have shown here it is I by I t because in a practical device you pass current, your control is on current. So, I by I t minus 1. So, this is the threshold current. How much is this threshold? At threshold therefore, we make I t, the small t standing for threshold, capital T standing for transparency. How big is this I t compared to this? So, you can see some numbers are put there. We have the this is 60 centimeter inverse typical value, alpha a is 600 centimeter inverse that is the material loss coefficient. So, this is equal to 0.1 alpha a by gamma p t which means i t i threshold by i t minus 1 equal to 0.1 or minus 1 goes to the other side 1.1 or i threshold i t is equal to 1.1 times i t. So, if you reach transparency current another 10 percent ahead if you go then you will reach the threshold current. Please see transparency current, see the clear distinction between the two. Transparency current is the current when the medium is no more absorbing. Any current beyond that, even if 1.001 times I t, you will have gain. But the laser says there is a minimum gain required to compensate for loss. And the threshold current corresponds to that minimum gain when you have gain equal to loss. So, gamma p t equal to loss. Is this clear? And therefore, the threshold current is always more than transparency current. This is when gain starts. This is when gain is equal to loss. And therefore, the threshold current is little higher than transparency current. So, 
beyond the threshold, beyond threshold, the power generated is proportional to the P optical is of the laser is proportional to this I minus I T, which means so for I greater than I greater than I T, because up to I T we need current to compensate for the losses in the resonator. Any additional current will give you additional optical power and therefore, P optical is proportional to I minus I T, it is a linear dependence and that is why you get the laser characteristic which is and here is the laser characteristic therefore, you have I and P optical then there is hardly any output up to the threshold, there is some output which comes because of spontaneous emission. The laser is because of stimulated emission and here it starts. So, this is the value where you have I P not transparency I threshold, it is the threshold current here. So, typical practical lasers have 30, 40 milli amperes as a threshold current, the laser diodes have 30 to 40 milli amperes normal ones. There are laser diodes which have threshold less than 1 milli ampere and there are laser diodes which have threshold much higher high current or high power laser diodes have threshold little higher. Normal ones have about 20 to 40 milli ampere. So, this is the current variation that is described and in the in one of the classes I had mentioned that the laser output is characterized by slope efficiency or differential responsivity slope efficiency which is the change in power dp for a change in current di so dp by di is the slope efficiency this is equal to dp by di is called slope efficiency you would like to have as high a slope efficiency as possible, so that a very small modulating current here, a very small excursion in a modulating signal here will lead to a large excursion in the optical power. So, the slope efficiency is important for uh, modulation. So, typical numbers are given 0 0.25, 0 0.35 and so on it is also called differential responsivity. Output characteristic, so we come to the output characteristic, earlier in the previous graph I had shown just one, but here what is shown is output characteristic with the temperature and you can see that it is extremely sensitive to temperature. The threshold which is here at the bottom, so here is the threshold, so at 30 degree if the threshold is 50 you see that at 60 degree it is increased to some 70 or 80 milli amperes. So, threshold is a strong function of temperature and therefore, what it means, what is its implication? Its implication is if you had biased here, let us say here at 75 milli ampere, okay, in this diagram at 75 milli ampere you had biased, which means at 75 milli ampere it was giving some power here optical power which is let us say 10 milli watt, 10 milli watt at 75 milli ampere at 30 degree centigrade. Due to some reason the laser diode started getting heated, slowly it is getting heated and if the temperature reaches 60 degree what happens? The output is 0, there is nothing because the threshold itself is 80 milli ampere. So, you had biased it at 75 but the threshold has become now 80. So, the threshold is drifting with temperature. So, laser diodes are very sensitive to temperatures and therefore, laser diodes are always used with temperature controllers. These are mounted on Peltier cooling elements to maintain a temperature. So, laser diode drivers you will see that will always have temperature controller because you have to maintain constant temperature if you want to use a particular characteristic. 
is very sensitive, it is characterized by, so what is given is here is an expression, I hope you can see that i t the threshold as a function, the threshold as a function of temperature is i 0 into e to the power i by i naught t by t naught, I am sorry, it is e to the power capital T by t naught, t naught is called the characteristic temperature, this is a material property. So, you can see some values of T naught are given, it is 140 K for gallium arsenide, larger the value of T naught means less sensitivity is for temperature. In fact, uh, if you use quantum well lasers, the T naught is very large for quantum well lasers, they are much less sensitive to temperature variations. Typically 350, 375 degrees is the T naught value for quantum well structures. Whereas, uh, indium phosphide lasers are more sensitive here and you can see it is T naught is. So, this is the relation which tells you how the threshold is shifting with temperature. Why is it shifting? Good question. Find out the answer. Why, why do you think that it shifts with temperature? Primary reason of course, is uh, with temperature tau the recombination time drops rapidly and tau drops rapidly means you see there is tau somewhere, where is tau? In the expression for delta and t we have in the expression for j t the transparency current density drops down rapidly j t is equal to delta n t this is a parameter to get the required separation into, so we had E into D divided by tau. We had delta N is equal to, all right, delta N, please see, we had this expression, delta N is equal to I by E into tau divided by L into W into D. So, I by L W is J, so J D and therefore, uh, J T is equal to, so this is J into, therefore, this tau drops down rapidly with temperature, the recomb carrier recombination drops down very rapidly because of non radiative recombinations, phonon transitions and if this drops down, transparency goes up the transparency current density and therefore, the threshold will go up. So, I t goes up, J t or I t goes up and threshold is about 10 percent or 20 percent more than the transparency and therefore, the threshold current will go up. This is the primary reason why the current goes up. So, we will uh, stop here at this point and uh, in the next class, we will take up uh, output characteristics, device characteristics, uh, various uh, spatial profiles, wavelength profile, spectrum and modes and so on.